This week, as I was thinking about the sermon, um, and I was thinking about the topic, the topic is honesty. Um, as I was thinking about that and what real life examples I have, um, the one that immediately came to mind is one that I've told you about and some of you know firsthand, but I'm going to tell you about it anyhow, um, it is this. I was, uh, this was now three years ago, about this time. In fact, it would be about two weeks from now. I was living in Wissahickon, Minnesota, where I was pastoring a church there, and uh, we had uh, a great graduating class. And we had some fantastic, just outstanding students graduating. And on that particular day, um, I want to say I had six different graduation parties to go to. Um, just it was, it was a busy, busy season. And so I went to these different parties, and I'd finally gotten to the last one. Um, uh, Brady Schumacher was his name. And, and Brady is a real neat kid. And so I'm there in like half the town. The Schumachers are, are, are very well-liked family in town. Everybody, everybody loves this family, frankly. And so, like, there's four or five hundred people at this party. I mean, it, it's just packed. And so I'm, you know, glad-handing, seeing everybody I know, going, talking, shaking hands, yada, 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 as it goes on. Eventually, I mean, I was there for so long, my head, you know, my hair's getting thin, sunburn on top of the head, and you know how that works. And uh, all of a sudden, my pocket started vibrating. I'm like, well, and it's, I'm, I'm in the middle of like a hundred people under a giant tent. It's just a roar of noise. So I reached down and quick eyeball it because I'm talking with somebody. Oh, I need to take this. This is, uh-oh, what time, oh, what time is it? I'm in trouble. You see, that particular day I had a telephone interview with a church. And that was about a half hour ago. Whoops. I don't know if they're going to hire me. So I, I, I quick run out of this place and get to somewhere a little bit quieter away from people, call them back and say, uh, you know what? I screwed up. What can I say at this point? And I said, if... I guess if you don't want to talk to me, I, I will fully understand that's not your fault. I made a mistake, and I'm completely sorry. I'm at your mercy. Tell me what you want, and I'll do whatever you want. And they said, well, no, we'd still like to talk to you. Okay, can you give me like 10 minutes to get run somewhere where it's quiet and I'm not standing next to a road? Yeah, yeah, call us back in 10 minutes. Okay, sure. So I quick drive to my house and then call them back and have, have what I thought was a good conversation with this particular church because uh, eventually they hired me. That's why I'm here. <laughs> so, I don't know if that was wisdom or stupidity on their part. You be the judge. But in that moment, I could have made up some story about why I wasn't there, but I screwed up. But in the end, the honesty, it, it seemed to have paid off at the very least, right? Now, on the topic of honesty, uh, it, it can be hard to be honest in this day and age in our culture, right? I mean, this is true across all aspects of our lives. Like, like if you're out playing mini golf, right? I love mini golf. My son, he's eight, almost nine, loves to play mini golf. Like, like every time we drive by a mini golf course, he's like a dog looking at a T-bone. Just, mini golf, can we play that? Not today, buddy, but eventually we'll go there. He loves mini golf. And, and when you play mini golf, it's, you know, you're hitting it around, you know, especially if you're with a larger group. Nobody's paying that close of attention to the score, right? So when you get, and you finally get it in the hole, they're like, well, what was your score? Now you're faced with that tough decision, especially if you're competitive, right? Was it a seven or was it a four? Do you want to win or do you want to be truthful? And it's particularly difficult if you're not highly skilled, because now you're really challenged. Where, what do I say? What do I do? And this is true, as I said, across all aspects of our lives. This happens in the workplace where you want to impress, where you need to meet your numbers, where the pressure is high. So we exaggerate. We, we pad the numbers a little, right? It happens when we share stories about our lives, about... Remember how good I used to be? Right? I ran this fast. I jumped this high. 
I cooked this many. I walked through this much snow up this big of a hill to get to school every day. Right? That's how it used to be. We did it when we were kids. Hey, Mom, I'm going to Tommy's house. (laughs) Right? And we never ended up at Tommy's house. We might have driven past Tommy's house on our way to somewhere else. Or we might have stopped long enough for Tommy to get in the car. But that was the extent of Tommy's house. Right? We knew it was a sham. In fact, the only place that I know of where everybody 100% of the time always tells the truth is when they are catching fish, right? (laughs) Anybody catch something on fishing opener? Yeah. 100% accuracy there. Did you know that by the age of four, 90% of all children know how to lie? Yikes. Yikes. In a a 2002 survey done by the University of Massachusetts, this was a fascinating study, they said that 60% of adults who were pulled could not have a 10-minute long conversation without telling a lie. And what they did was they recorded people talking for 10 minutes. And what's worse than that, 60% couldn't go without telling a lie, is that 40% didn't even know all of the lies that they told in those 10 minutes. Because you see, at the end of recording them, they played it back. And, and this was after they'd asked, well, wh- how many lies did you tell us? And then as they watched the video, they had said, oh, I lied to you four times. And they saw in the video, like, seven. They couldn't even remember all the lies that they had told in just 10 minutes. That's how comfortable many of us have become with lying. Be honest, how many of you never once lied to your parents? Raise your hands. Yeah? Never once. Right? Al's hand went up. He's brave. Now, if those of you with your hands up that were up, how many of you are lying right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? We lie to our parents. We lie to our friends. We lie to our bosses. We lie to our spouses. We lie to our children. We lie on our taxes. If you're dating, we lie to impress there. We lie to the officer when she pulls us over and she says, Do you know why I pulled you over? No, it was not nothing to do with me driving about 20 over the speed limit, officer. No. I don't know why. Why would you have pulled me over? I'm a perfectly law-abiding citizen, right? We lie on our driver's license when it says, How much do you weigh? Is anybody truthful there? Anybody? No. One? We got one truth teller there, right? Liar, liar, pants on fire. We are liars. The pants on fire meter. Think about this for a minute, though. Think about the impact this has on our lives, on our world, on our Christian witness. There's consequences to lying, even little ones. Any activity where we work with others... Our efforts are hindered when we are not honest with one another. As we go through this series that I've I've called Modern Family and Vintage Values, and when we we look at the church and the family of God, and that which should be the, the, the most valuable possessions in our lives, and those relationships that are in our lives around us, those people who are around us, what what exactly are they hearing from us? You see, God highly values honesty. But yet we lie. And we as humans have this terribly long history of lying, don't we? All the way back, way, way back to the very beginnings of the Bible with Adam and Eve. So we've gotten pretty good at this over the years, haven't we? Now to dig in further on the subject, we're going to be looking at Acts 5, 1 through 11 today. A story you've probably heard before. It's a story of Ananias and Sapphira. Let me give you a little bit of background before we get into that of of what's going on here because this passage can be a little perplexing and um, I don't want you to be confused as to what's going on. And as we look at it, I don't want you to miss what this text is about. This text is about deception more than anything else. So for context, 
you need to know this is the early church. This is the beginning, back way back, Acts 4, Acts 5. The church is just getting off the ground. The disciples, they're, they're still pretty green. They're learning how to be the church. They're figuring out how to love and support one another now that Christ is no longer with them. And, and, and all the disciples, they're just trying to work their way through this. And what do we do with all of these people? Because the church had begun to grow. And what do we do with all these people who are coming to faith? And, 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 and how do we handle this? And how do we meet their needs? And what do we do? And what do we do in this? And oh, a lot going on in the early church. And what is really cool is if you, you look back, you see in both Acts 2 as well as in Acts 4, you see that they were doing some pretty neat and amazing things as an early church. Um, some of the disciples, you see, they were, they were doing this pretty amazing thing. There was people who were actually going and selling their possessions to meet the needs of those around them. They looked at what they had and they said, well, I've got more than I really need and I see that you don't have enough. Let me take care of that for you. And so they were selling their possessions. They were taking care of one another. If there was a a need, somebody sold something and then the funds were used to advance God's kingdom. It was an exciting time. It It was a sacrificial time. It was a time where where God was moving in significant and amazing ways, if you read that early part of Acts. And so it says then in in Acts 4 that one of the disciples, right before the story we have in Acts 5, right there in Acts 4, at the end of Acts 4, it says in Acts 4, 36 and 37, it says, A man that they called Barnabas sold a field that he owned, and he brought the money and he placed it at the apostles' feet. There was some significant need, and good old Barney steps up to the plate in a big way to meet the need to the glory of God. Here we have an example of generosity, of radical generosity, of sacrifice, and of honesty in Barnabas. And if you're, you're taking notes, this is your first note that you'll see here. Honesty is healthy. We hopefully learn that at an early age. So, so then you can hopefully finish this line for me. Remember our parents and our teachers saying this to us. Honesty is the best what? Honesty is the best policy. Honesty is the mark of a healthy disciple. When we are honest, we are modeling who God is. A God who is honest and trustworthy. There's nothing false about Him whatsoever. God is trustworthy. He is a God who stands up against injustice. He is all about what is right in the world. Titus 1-2 says this, In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the age began. God does not lie. God's nature is one of honesty and that of truth. But you see, truth doesn't and shouldn't end with Him. He calls us to be people or ambassadors of truth and honesty as well. And there are dozens of different verses throughout the Bible that will support this. Places where God calls us as His followers to be honest and true. God even put it in the Ten Commandments, right? Where we are told not to give false testimony against our neighbor. And according to God, everyone is our neighbor. So we need to speak the truth to all, and not just some, to all. And doing so creates healthy relationships. Honesty has to be the foundation of our relationships, otherwise they all begin to crumble. So what would your life look like for you to imitate God's honesty in your life? What would your life look like if you were honest as God is honest? Well, now in Acts chapter 5, we now see the crux of the problem. Let me read it for you. It's Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. It says, But a man by the name of Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. Sounds just like Barnabas, right? And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land? 
While it remained unsold, Peter says, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, wasn't it still at your own disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he breathed his last breath. He died. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and they wrapped him up. And they carried him out. And it says, after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Sapphira, tell me whether you sold the land and how much did you sell it for? And she said, yes, we sold it for so much. Verse 9, but Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. And immediately, she fell down at his feet and breathed her last breath. Dead. When the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out too. And they buried her beside her husband. And a great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who had heard of these things. Interesting story there in Scripture. Curious. So Ananias and Sapphira, just like Barnabas, they sell some land, right? But they keep back a little portion for themselves. Now you might be saying, what's wrong with that, right? And the answer is nothing. There's nothing wrong with keeping back a portion of it. Nothing at all. They weren't required to give the proceeds, all of the proceeds of the sale. So what was so grievous, so what was so bad, that it cost them both their life? In verse 4, we see Peter confronting Ananias about the situation. And Peter addresses the situation very directly, and he says, Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Yes. And after it was sold, wasn't the money of your own personal disposal? Yes. What made you do such a thing? You've not lied to man, but to God. The truth is, it wasn't the money that they held back at all. That wasn't the issue. Peter says it was all theirs to begin with. Rather, it was them thinking that they could lie to God, that they could be deceptive, yet still receive the same recognition that Barnabas had received when he made his sacrificial giving giving of his piece of property. So they lie, and consequently, they both drop dead. Now, good news for us. I'm here to tell you, thankfully, God's judgment's not always that quick, is it? Or we'd none of us be here. God's judgment is not always so quick nor severe. But what I want you to come away with today is with the thought that lies will indeed cost you something, even if you're not struck dead in the moment. There's a woman who was coming home from work one day, and she stops by a a local meat market right before close to buy some chicken for supper for her family. Butcher reaches in the case and grabs the very last chicken, and he throws it up on the scale to weigh it, right? He tells her what size it is. She remarks to him that she really needs a a little more chicken than that to feed her family. So takes it off, sticks it back in the case, reaches around with his arm inside the case for a while, grabs the same chicken, plumps it back up on top of the scale, and tells her it weighs a pound more than the last time. She looks at it and says, You know, I think I'll take both. Yeah. Lies lies will cost us something. Lies will catch up with us. In our passage today, it costs two people their lives. Deception will cost us something every single time. You may not see it right away. In the short term, maybe you might even see some benefits of your lies, right? You might, you might benefit from maybe some financial gain, or maybe you'll get a little bit of success, or maybe you know, something good will happen, or some temporary satisfaction from your lie, but whatever it might be. But those gains do come at a price. And many times, what we gain from our sin is not nearly as great as the pain that will follow. Proverbs 17.4 says, An evildoer listens to wicked lips, and a liar gives ear to a mischievous tongue. 
In other words, when we begin to listen to others, when we begin to listen to ourselves, that we can get away with it, that this behavior is just fine. It's all good, right? It just leads to greater and greater deception. But Jesus said in Mark 8, 6, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit his soul? So when we think about that little lie that seems so innocent, right? Seems harmless. Maybe that little sin might even be gratifying. You gain something in the short term, money, fame, whatever it is, But is it worth your soul? Is the false gotten gain so sweet that it might cost you your marriage? That it might cost you a friendship? That it might cost you a job? That it might cost you your parents' trust? Your standing in your community? Your relationship with your friends? Is that little bit of gain worth that loss? It all starts with one little lie and then it builds from there. The cost of the lie often far outweighs the perceived benefit for it. Yet we lie anyhow. You know why? That's called sin. We're sinners, right? We're liars. We lie. We sin. I don't know, have, have, have any of you ever seen firsthand the damage a forest fire can cause? Yeah, some of you have. I've seen it firsthand. Entire mountains blackened with few to no trees left standing. Whole regions decimated. How do those fires start? Well, frequently they start almost always from very small sources. A careless cigarette tossed out a car window. The hot exhaust on an off-road vehicle or a motorcycle. A single bolt of lightning. And when it's done, thousands if not tens or hundreds of thousands of acres can be burned and destroyed to nothingness. You see, forest fires always start small. During the summer of 1996, I was a a trail crew foreman at Philmont Scout Ranch in the area of Cimarron, New Mexico. And our job was to build a trail, and it was a brand new trail. There'd never been a trail in this part of the camp. To build a trail through uh, this lush, dense conifer forest of the Rocky Mountains there. And and part of the job is there's there's somebody who goes out and they sight out where the trail is. And my job as the foreman was to make sure we follow that trail. Because we have certain grades we have to keep, and we have certain runoff angles that we have to maintain. And so if they have gone through and flagged it here. If there's a tree there, the tree moves. If there's a rock there, the rock moves. If there's a mountain there, we're going to go through it. We'll find a way. And that's what you do. And so I worked for an entire summer in this beautiful, pristine forest that had never had trails through it, that never had people really probably ever hiking through it all the way back to the times of the Anasazi Indians who lived in that area. It's a beautiful, pristine patch of land. Well, then in 2002, that winter of 2001-2002 was a very dry winter. And then that summer, the the rains that always come didn't come. And late one night, uh, a cloud came through and a bolt of lightning struck. And it burned down this little corner of my heaven on earth. Destroyed it. Uh, I don't know if Joey's got the picture or not, but burned it to the ground. Um, just, Just made a wreck of all of the work that we had done. And in an instant, that little thing began to grow. It started as a tiny little bolt of lightning, and before you knew it, about 25,000 acres of forest were destroyed. When we lie, we don't know the ripples it's going to create. We don't know how it's going to grow. We don't... We don't know if it's just going to be that little lightning strike and maybe the window go out or if, like often happens with flies, the damage will be far greater than we ever anticipated. So what are we to do? Well, the solution is quite simple. The journey to honesty is vulnerability. You might see that in your notes. 
The journey to honesty is vulnerability. It is beginning to tell the truth regardless of what the consequences might be. Now, as I'm sitting here talking about this, some of us know right now exactly where it is we need to start. We have friends that we have hurt, relationships that we have damaged, bonds that we have broken because we have not been honest. Dealing with those is a good place to start, but it's a terrible place to stop because my guess is we have a whole bunch of other lies that we haven't even been caught in yet, right? It's not enough just to deal with the big ones that we've been caught in, but really we need to clean up our messes. We have some business to do. And the longer we put off dealing with the lies, the larger the lies grow. The greater the damage it does, the more hurtful it will be when it is exposed. Often we try to avoid doing this because we are afraid that honesty is going to hurt us, frankly. Yes, we're afraid that if we're honest, it's going to hurt somebody else. But we're really mostly afraid, if I'm honest, it's going to hurt me. And so we're often afraid to be honest. And so we avoid the truth. We keep the lie going. We pile on more lies to cover the original lie. You ever built the house of cards? You ever taken a card deck out and built that little house of cards like when you were a kid? How high could you get? Two levels, maybe three? But what eventually happens? It all comes falling down. It's not stable. It can't remain. Yes, honesty might cost you something. But going back to who God is and who His nature is, do we imitate God? Or are we going to imitate the world around us? Are we just going to look the other way, pass it off just as that's the way life goes, right? That's just how we operate here. That's just how life is. Sometimes we, we justify our behavior by saying or, or thinking that we are protecting ourselves. Or maybe we're protecting somebody else by telling those lies. But look at Proverbs 27.6. It says, Faithful are the wounds of friends. Profuse are the kisses of the enemy. You see, in a good relationship, in a healthy relationship, to a true friend, to somebody you do actually love, we can speak hard words. Yes, those hard words hurt. But we can still speak truthfully. The truth might wound, but in those wounds we can find healing. I remember back when I was a child, I got a, 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 a very large splinter in my hand. Big old chunk of wood, right? And when I'd move my hand, I would feel it inside there, right? By the way, don't Google splinters and infection. I did that last night. That was a mistake. Sliver in my hand. And I'd move it and I'd bump it and it would really hurt. But I really didn't want to show my mom because I knew what she would do to get it out. So I tried to ignore it a couple of days, tried to hide it. Started getting more red, more painful, more swollen. So finally I went and showed it to my mom because of course all always get shown to mom first, right? That's the way it works in this world. And I showed it to her. But I knew there was going to be some pain involved. But I had to get this wood out of me. So she got out the Bactine. How many of you remember Bactine? Remember that evil stuff? Should have been outlawed by the Geneva Convention. <laughs> the device of torture. For those of you who don't know what Bactine was, it's an antiseptic spray. And when you spray it on the wound to sterilize, it's effectively like as if you had just poured boiling oil on your hand. There it is. It says, no sting. Lies. <laughs> Lies. Do not believe the Bactine company. So mom gets out the Bactine, hoses it down. My hand is on fire. She gets out the little match and heats up a little needle and pricks that around the, the pussy little thing in my hand and she works it out. By the time she gets it out, I think it was big enough she could have carved a spoon out of that chunk of wood. I mean, <laughs> seriously, it was bad. 
<laughs> All right. I was wondering if anybody would catch on. But when it came out, right, then, then the pus came out, right? The infection was in there. Had I, had I dealt with it sooner, the infection wouldn't have been there. I wouldn't have had to deal with the ongoing pain and the much larger problem that it became that I had been experiencing for days. Our lives are a lot like that. They might be hidden under the surface, but they begin to fester and grow and worsen. We're much better off dealing with it early and getting the painful part out of the way quickly so we can get on to healing. The other side of this equation is, is when you've been lied to. If we are going to expect people to be honest to us, we need to be gracious in those moments. When we are lied to, we need to respond with grace. The truth is, some people are really hard to tell the truth to, right? Because you know how they're going to respond. And so you don't want to deal with that. So we avoid it. We fib. We outright lie to avoid the conflict that comes with telling that person the truth. Don't be that person. If someone is going to be vulnerable and bring forth the truth, listen to them. Acknowledge that you are hurt, but do so in a healthy way. This doesn't mean there won't be consequences for what happened or that we just forget that we were lied to, but our response of grace and peace in those times of broken trust can change the whole relationship. When we are dealing with these hard things, we have to do so in love. That can be hard, but we have to seek reconciliation and love. So I'll wrap this up, and I want to close it out with just three quick ideas for you. Three ways that you can begin to think about your own honesty. The first one is figure out why and where and to whom you have brought deception. You see, for many of us, there are patterns in our life for our lives. Specific things, specific areas that we are trying to cover up and hide. Places that over and over and over again we find ourselves lying about. For some of us, it's just a desire to make ourselves look better in someone's eyes. So we exaggerate. Do you lie so that people will like you better? Do you lie to avoid embarrassment? We need to take a self-inventory. What people, what environment do I keep finding myself lying in? Become aware of it and then deal with it. Break the pattern and come clean. The second thing to do is Avoid white lies. And we all make little white lies, don't we? Grandma asks you, Honey, how did you like the cat sweater I knitted you for Christmas? <laughs> First, we don't like cats. Second, we don't own cats. But that doesn't mean we get to put Grandma on blast. And it also doesn't mean we should lie to her. We don't have to hide behind white lies. You can be appreciative of the gift without having to like it even. That's the idea behind the phrase that it's the thought that counts. How about just, thank you for thinking of me, Grandma, with a smile on your face. And the third and final thing is this. Sometimes you're simply better to say nothing at all. Right? We know this, but we need to be reminded of this from time to time. Oftentimes, we can keep from lying if we would just keep our big yappers shut. Like I said last week, right? Honey, how does this dress look on me? Darling, I love you, you're beautiful, and I will be downstairs where it's safer. <laughs> no lies, no white lies. The saying is, the better part of valor is discretion. We have to know when to not say anything at all. And for some of us, that is particularly challenging. You see, folks, honesty may cost us something, but the benefits are so much better 
We don't have to carry that lie and try to keep things straight. We no longer have to bear the burden of that sin knowing that we have screwed up. Honesty means that we have integrity. It matters to our Christian witness. God is looking for honest men and women that He can trust. People who not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. People who keep their word, who don't exaggerate to impress. Let's be those people. Let's be that church. Let's strive together to live in integrity with honesty and then model that for the watching world. Are you with me? Let's pray.